Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. You have been watching Adam Kasky and Katie Blake watch us through this severe line of storms, including the threat of tornadoes throughout the evening for the past several hours. You're now looking at a live shot from Justin Horn and the storm chaser. They are headed over to the northwest side where Adam was just talking about that there is some storm damage in that area. Yeah, not only the severe thunderstorm warnings, but Adam and Katie and Justin have all been telling you that the wind is just a big deal with this one. Culebra and Alamo Ranch area, some trees down, some transformers hit. And we do know at 281 and winding way that southbound lane is closed because a drain overflowed and a car was stalled right there in the middle of 281. So we're watching all of these high flood areas as well. As Adam was just saying, we now have 40,848 power outages, which is actually, uh, actually down a couple thousand from just 10 minutes ago. It's a good sign. Let's check in with Katie Blake, still tracking these storms. Yeah, as you can see there on live cam and with our storm chaser, uh, things for the most part here in San Antonio, we're just left with the rain now, right? Some lingering lightning as well. But for our counties and our communities east of 35, the leading edge of this line of storms is continuing to barrel to the east, moving at about 40, 45 miles per hour. So it will be moving into some of our easternmost communities during this newscast. We'll continue to keep you updated. This line of storms does have a history of producing damage to some homes in and around Bear County. Uh, even up near Medina Lake. So still a very dangerous line, a squall line of storms that will continue to move east. We'll keep you updated. Just know if you're in San Antonio, the worst of the wind has moved past, but we've still got some rain and flash flood warnings will be out for a couple more hours. We'll break all that down for you. We'll have continuing coverage of tonight's severe weather coming up in this newscast. We'll check back in with you and Adam as necessary throughout this show. Meanwhile, one man is dead tonight following a pursuit with the Bear County Sheriff's Office. We're going to give you a map right now. This happened on the city's east side at the 7500 block of FM 78 near Walsham. According to Sheriff Javier Salazar, a deputy in the area ran a license plate on a vehicle and saw that it was reported stolen. This led to a short chase before the driver turned into a nearby parking lot and ran from those deputies. Now, when they caught up to that man, they approached him and they say that's when he pulled out a gun and shot himself in the head. He was pronounced dead at the scene. BCSO not able to identify that man, yet the storm's coming in as this was happening. But they do say he was only wearing boxers and boots. They also believe he might have had a wallet on him, which they will be checking. Uh, he is believed to be in his early 40s. BCSO has established a task force in this area due to the high crime rate. We'll continue to follow the story and bring you the latest as we learn it. And we're continuing to follow the weather, but right now let's turn to some coronavirus coverage and the latest numbers for Bear County. Mayor Ron Nuremberg today real, revealing there are now 2,442 cases. Unfortunately, our streak of no local deaths has ended with the announcement of three additional losses, bringing our total to 69 deaths. Those deaths, a man in his 50s, a woman also in her 50s, and a man in his 90s. All three died at Methodist Hospital. Countywide, 79 people hospitalized, a little bit up, with 41 in the ICU and 20 on ventilators. If you're not taking the proper precautions with the virus out there, then by the time you fail to comply with the health professional's guidance, it's probably too late. Ron Nuremberg reacting to large crowds along Texas rivers this Memorial Day weekend. Countless people were seen floating close together at the Comal River today despite social distancing guidelines. The night team Stephen Cavazos was in New Braunfels with what some of those people had to say. If I get it, everybody else getting it. Hey, it's life. DeAndre Napoleon says he's not worried. This is his third week coming out to Prince Sums Park along the Comal River. Napoleon says he's not surprised to see the large amount of people today. He says they are responsible for their own health. You will have to put that in consideration coming to the river, which is going to be a lot of people in the water. Other areas around New Braunfels saw a good amount of people along River Outfitters, which reopened earlier this month. Now, social distancing guidelines are still in place, but here along the Comal River, well, that's up to interpretation. People seen here diving in. <laughs> cheering, and even serenading. Happy birthday to you. Cha, cha, cha. I'm worried, but at the same time, you know, it's, you know, it's whatever. Mario Camacho drove here from Houston. He says he's been at home too long and was ready to get back to the outdoors. We've just been at home with the quarantine and all that stuff, bro. So we decided to come out here and have a good time, bro. Esther Harris came out to celebrate her 20th birthday with her friends, who she says were her quarantine sisters. Harris says none of them have shown symptoms of the virus, but they believe it's because they've stayed away from others until today, 
She's hopeful people will keep their distance. You should be taking precautions out of respect out of other people. And for those who may be getting a little too close for comfort, Harris have this to say. It's not going to harm you by staying six feet away. Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. In other news tonight, Ryan Shows was just dropping something off at work when he was viciously attacked and nearly killed. The man he claims repeatedly stabbed him at the time was out on bail, facing charges for a previous violent attack. So what did the judge do this time? Gave him bail again, putting him right back on the streets. It's tonight's Defender's Investigation. I didn't realize I had been stabbed. I thought I had just been punched. Uh, it turned out he got me twice in the shoulder, once in the back of the neck, and once in the face. Ryan Shows had just returned to his truck parked in the 400 block of East Travis downtown where he found all four of his tires slashed. Minutes before, Shows said a man confronted him about parking in a no-loading zone. And uh, I said, well, you know what, it's my vehicle, not yours. So if it gets towed, it's on me. While Shows was inspecting the damage to the tires and talking to his insurance company on the phone, that suspect unexpectedly returned. And I was just like, hey, you're not going anywhere. And then that's when everything happened. The knife attack left Shows critically wounded. He was rushed to the hospital where he underwent surgery. The surgeon telling Shows' wife, Rose, how lucky he was. She said he, there was almost an artery that was hit. Um, she said if it was somebody that was smaller or in not as good a shape, they would have just bled to death on the street. The suspect ran away, but witnesses identified him as 38-year-old David Garcia, a man with a history of being arrested for drugs, theft, deadly conduct, injury to the disabled, and he was out on bond for another violent assault. In August 2017, Garcia was arrested. He allegedly got into an argument with two bouncers who were trying to close this strip club. According to a police report, Garcia got into his car, turned the key, and hit the gas, driving straight at the bouncers. An open door knocked one to the ground while another got caught on the vehicle and was dragged 20 feet. 18 months later, Garcia was hit with two felony indictments for assault with a deadly weapon. Unable to make the $75,000 bond, he sat in jail for five months. Acting as his own attorney, Garcia filed motion after legal motion claiming he is a guardian of freedom and the American way of life and saying he has three general orders to follow, including guarding everything within the limits of my post and only quitting my post when properly relieved. In another filing, Garcia also said he was a combat veteran with a diagnosis of PTSD with schizoaffective disorder. Eventually, two things happened. In May and June of 2019, Judge Jennifer Pena of the 290th District Court ordered a mental health assessment to see if Garcia was competent to stand trial, and she reduced his bond to $50,000 with the condition he submit to monthly drug and alcohol screenings. By July, Garcia was back on the streets. But the two-year-old case then seemed to grind to a halt. That mental health evaluation that was ordered never happened. Seven months later, Garcia is involved in that near-fatal stabbing, which landed his case before Judge Pena again. And... I'm not happy about it. Um... I'm not happy about it at all. Once again, the judge gave Garcia bail and he was released, much to his accuser's astonishment. I do question on the fact of what was their reasoning behind thinking that it was okay to let this guy out. Judge Pena said she couldn't comment on the specifics of the case because it's still pending in her court. She said her decision to grant Garcia bond was based entirely on this single page document. It's a violation report. It shows Garcia's original crime, his bond, and that he hadn't completed the mental health evaluation. While the document shows the new crime was another aggravated assault, what it doesn't show is a detailed description of the new allegations. Pena said, based on the circumstances that were presented to me at the time and the violation report in the order, I felt that what I did was appropriate. But with the courts virtually shut down due to coronavirus, Ryan and his wife wait for the wheels of justice to turn and worry about what David Garcia might do next. It, it seems like he continues to, you know, just to kind of slip through the cracks. I can't change what's happened. I can't worry about what's going to happen. All I can sit there and do basically is just worry about today and be thankful that I'm here. I did attempt to contact David Garcia to get his side of the story, but when I went to his home, he said through an open window that he had no comment. We'll let you know what happens as this case moves forward.
She is a San Antonio nurse who spent nearly 50 days in New York City helping an overwhelmed hospital during the coronavirus pandemic. She's now home and her family who missed her dearly planned a very special surprise for her. The night team's Jaffney Gray was there and brings us that story. I needed to be there and help as much as I, in any way that I could. Registered nurse Erica Barrera has been back in San Antonio since Friday. More than 40 days prior, she left for New York City to join the other healthcare workers on the front line of the coronavirus pandemic. She says being in an overwhelmed hospital in one of the country's epicenters was a life-changing experience. We had per, you know, protection that we had that we never took off. Barrera worked in the hospice unit where she tended to families who said their final goodbyes to their loved ones. Days, she says, were very hard. I know you haven't seen your husband for a while but he's going to look different from what you know of him. He's going to have tubes coming out of, from his mouth, his nose, you know, just everywhere. So I want you to, when you walk in, just to not be afraid and I'll be with you. At least 10 times, Barrera says she had to go through that gut-wrenching experience. Here they are coming to my floor just to have their last moments and it was, it was scary. She says the recoveries were a blessing to everyone. There is hope that we will come out of this. Barrera knew she was making a difference, but she also knew she missed her family. What she did not know is this. I could see her eyes watering when she was walking this way. Her loved ones organized a warming welcome back surprise for Barrera, who was currently in quarantine at this hotel. A thank you, she says, made her service that much more worth it. Turned the corner and I saw everybody and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. Jeffrey Gray, case at 12 News. Welcome home and thank you for your service. Continued coronavirus coverage and severe weather updates from Katie, Black, Bla Katie Blake and Adam Kasky <laughs> coming up next. They were not simply names on a list. They were us, a subheadline from the front page of the New York Times today, which listed 1,000 of the near 100,000 deaths related to coronavirus right here in the U.S. This as Americans have been heading out this Memorial Day weekend, crowding beaches and bars with many not practicing social distancing. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimper with the details. Many Americans weary after months of stay at home orders are now heading to beaches, boardwalks and bars this holiday weekend, leading to some worrisome scenes as many defied social distancing guidelines. In Missouri's Lake of the Ozarks, bars and pool parties packed with people, very few wearing masks. I'm happy that a lot of people are out, maybe dangerous, but we'll see the cases when we see this weekend over. The boardwalk in Ocean City, Maryland, also crowded with people. It's really crowded. It's beautiful out, you know, it's fun. Everybody's having fun. And in Florida, large crowds descended on Daytona Beach. This type of behavior is unacceptable. We don't want people coming to our city, disrupting our city. As all 50 states have begun to ease restrictions, at least eight are seeing an increase in new cases. But President Trump has vowed the country will not lock down again, even if there's a second wave. Some good news this weekend for sports lovers. The NBA in talks with Disney, the parent company of ABC News, to resume its season at the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex in Orlando. No travel and no fans in the stands. In New York, Governor Cuomo announcing sports leagues can be begin training camps. We want people to be able to watch sports to the extent people are still staying home. It gives people something to do. It's a return to normalcy. Sunday afternoon, Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson joined Tom Brady and Peyton Manning in a charity golf tournament, raising millions of dollars for COVID relief efforts. The PGA is set to return to its full schedule in June, but with no spectators. This year, the pandemic has changed how America is honoring those who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Arlington National Cemetery is open only for families with a special pass to visit their loved one's grave. And the nation's annual Memorial Day concert from Washington, D.C. was recorded on the West Lawn of the Capitol as usual, but with no live audience. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, Washington. All right, let's turn our attention back to the weather. It has been our big story here tonight. Adam and Katie have been tracking the storms and our Justin Horn has been out in Storm Chaser. He is in a neighborhood now on the northwest side. We don't have an exact location, but he is in an area that we know has some uh, storm damage from these. Yeah, that wind having roofs, fences, windows were broken. The good news, though, here is as Katie and Adam, you guys have been talking about as soon as those storms blow through, 
CPS is able to get out there and we have at least 2,000 fewer outages than were reported when we started this newscast right now. It's 39,951. So if you're one of those people, just be patient. Uh, they are going to try to make their way out to you. Yeah, be patient with them and, and, you know, stay home for the rest of the night. No reason to get out there because we've still got some, some lingering rain and we'll let the CPS crews do their job. And uh, these were some very strong winds that came through a portion of Bear County tonight, and we've been pouring through some of the damage reports. Yeah, and where Justin was, uh, that's basically 1604 and Braun Road on the northwest side of town, north of Alamo Ranch area, and that's the Wild Horse subdivision, and I've seen photos of some chunks of fences blown away, and there was a credible report of a part of a wall that was blown away from a master bedroom. So that's why Justin's there. They're going to scope it out. This is the latest on the radar. Here's the activity. San Antonio, it's coming to an end. Uh, once you're on the back side of this, once everything starts to quiet down and taper off, nothing else to worry about. You're done. It's over with. You're OK. Just enjoy the last little bit of light rain that can hopefully lull you to sleep. But here's the leading edge of it. That's pushing eastward at about 45 miles per hour. A lot of lightning. You see all those lightning strikes. We also have some warnings here with this. So Gonzalez in a, se a severe thunderstorm warning and even other locations as you head southward down this line. We're talking Wilson County, Carnes County, Gonzales County, and down even into B County. So moving to the east at 45 miles per hour, we can track out this path for you and give you an idea of when it'll get to some respective communities here along the track and give you a quick little update on the timeline of this system. Uh, Poe with the 1022, so basically right now, you're looking at Stockdale at 1028 p.m., Carn City at about 1033, Gonzales at about 1045, uh, Yorktown at 1109. Okay, so that's the leading edge, the strongest part of it with it. Quick burst of wind, the strong wind, potentially up to 60 miles per hour with it. A lot of lightning and thunder and even some hail, but the primary threat and risk here is straight line winds, which is what we have seen so far um, along this line. Now for a closer look at what we can expect going forward and for the rest of the night, let's go over to Katie with that information. Yeah, thanks for timing that out, Adam. And as you look at our high resolution model here, it's a little bit behind because it's showing 10 o'clock and the line is just working through San Antonio. So keep that in mind. But you saw as we get closer to 1130 midnight, that leading edge, those strongest winds will be moving through some of our easternmost counties. And this is going to continue to move east and it will be Houston's problem by early tomorrow morning. Now, there could be some lingering rain, even a few rumbles of thunder for the next several hours and even through tomorrow morning. I can't rule out a stray shower here or there, but what I really want to stress to you is that you can sleep easy tonight. Once that leading edge gets past you, those strong winds, just some lingering rain and uh, some flashes of lightning there. Here's three o'clock tomorrow afternoon, just like today, just like Saturday. I expect your Memorial Day to be generally rain free in the daytime hours. Can't rule out late in the afternoon in the evening, some pop up showers and storms developing. And then we are expecting another complex of storms to move in from the north and west late tomorrow night into early on Tuesday morning. We won't worry about that right now. Just know for the next couple of hours through about midnight, some lingering rain, some flashes of lightning that could be possible through about two o'clock in the morning as well. I really think we'll be starting to wrap up the rain by then and then just a stray shower and some clouds as we get into dawn tomorrow morning. A look at your Memorial Day forecast through lunchtime, partly to mostly cloudy skies, and we'll hold on to a 20 to 30 percent chance of an isolated shower or storm through the evening hours. But then overnight tomorrow we'll be watching for similar to what we saw tonight, not necessarily exactly the same in terms of placement and severity but another round of some late day storms, some nighttime storms tomorrow. And then we get into Tuesday. Things really start to settle down here. We'll get into Wednesday, Thursday, 20% chance of an isolated shower and then pick back up with a slightly higher coverage of showers and storms as we get into the start of next weekend. We'll continue to track the squall line as it continues to move east tonight uh, on the rest of the night beat. We'll get you some more uh, looks from the storm chaser coming up as well. Thank you, Katie. Excellent job to you and Adam. At one point I was watching and had my family get under the stairs, so I know a lot of people were uh, very uh, thankful for you guys being on air tonight. Yeah, of course. We'll be back with more. We'll be right back after this. 
The doors are open for pro teams to return to training camps or facilities in New York. With more on sports returning on Instant Replay, let's check in with our Greg Sims. Yeah, this is great news because that's one of the hardest hit areas by the coronavirus. And the NBA is ready for a restart as well with negotiations underway with Disney World in Orlando. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. We want people to be able to watch sports to the extent people are still staying home. It gives people something to do. Great news, the governor of New York giving the green light for all pro sports to return to a state to their facilities to begin training camp. This is considered a huge step in getting sports back on track in the United States and back in business as well. One of the hardest hit areas of the COVID-19 pandemic. That is what the NBA is also negotiating with Disney World of Orlando about restarting their season at the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex in late July. You know, it's like you start to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and you just, you know, I, I don't know, it felt like it felt like I opened up a Christmas gift and, and, and it was some good news. High school athletes are being welcomed back to their campuses starting next month, but with a list of restrictions that the UIL has outlined for all schools. And I, Larry Ramirez, with a story on family affair when it comes to basketball. You know, you got to get up, you got to move, you got to believe in yourself. And that's what Alexa's doing. And don't miss Jessica Hunt's story on Alexis Cook, who signed her letter of intent this week at George Gervin Academy to play wheelchair basketball for a nationally came program. It's Tiger versus Phil. It's Brady versus Manny. Live golf resumes with Mother Nature playing a factor, and NASCAR drops a green flag on the Memorial Day weekend as other racing events are either canceled or postponed. All that plus, we lose a basketball Hall of Famer before he's inducted into the Hall of Fame this August. And do you believe it's safe for high school workouts to resume June 8th? Tonight, you decide. Instant replay is live. And it's after the night beat. Great job by our weather department tonight. Did. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. The night beat continues right after this. We, of course, will get you back to that severe weather coverage in a few minutes. But first, the coronavirus pandemic has changed the way many Americans are remembering the servicemen and women that we've lost. Yeah, many events now taking place virtually. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimbert with the details. On this Memorial Day, amid the coronavirus pandemic, Americans are finding new ways to honor those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Arlington National Cemetery open only for families with a special pass to visit their loved one's grave. For everyone else, a virtual tour is available online. USAA, a financial services company that serves military members and their families, teaming up with Snapchat, allowing users to experience the annual Poppy Wall of Honor on the National Mall in Washington. Washington, D.C., each flower representing a fallen service member. Veterans in Delaware, Ohio, replacing worn American flags at the graves of servicemen and women buried there. We're going to give it our best shot to honor all of our fallen veterans. And a freedom ride at Pine Law Memorial Park in Wisconsin, the bikers and car enthusiasts visiting every veteran's grave. With uh, COVID-19, everything is being canceled. Uh, not to show any kind of respect to our fallen brothers and sisters is not the right thing to do. Bonnie Carroll, military widow and founder of Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, known as TAPS, is keeping the organization's annual survivor seminar going this year. So what we've done is we've shifted it all to a virtual platform and even right down to our family program, folks are coming together online and connecting. There's a big white house, it's on it. And the nation's annual Memorial Day concert from Washington, D.C., much of it recorded on the West Lawn of the Capitol as usual, but this year without an audience. NFL player and National Guardsman Ben Garland urging everyone to remember the true meaning of the holiday. I just encourage everybody to take a moment this Memorial Day to, to stop, re remember somebody who's lost, maybe learn about some of the stories of those who gave their lives. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, Washington, D.C. The Food and Drug Administration reminding Americans not to let their guards down when it comes to the coronavirus. FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn tweeted this morning that the virus is not contained yet. He urged Americans to follow safety guidelines as they go ahead with their Memorial Weekend plans. That includes social distancing, hand washing, and wearing face masks. Dr. Hahn's tweet came as people in many states head to beaches, cookouts, and bars. And this is the type of scene he was warning about. You may have seen this video from the Ozarks in Missouri earlier in our newscast, but we want to show it again as a reminder of what experts say you should not be doing this weekend. You can see a crowd of people packing a swimming pool near the Lake of the Ozarks yesterday. 
much less than six feet apart, despite Missouri's reopening plan saying social distancing is still a must. And while coronavirus does not spread in water, staying six feet apart is particularly important at pools because swimmers cannot wear face masks. In neighboring Arkansas, a group of people recently contracted the coronavirus after going to a high school party. Meanwhile, in Indiana, the Indy 500 isn't taking place at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway this Memorial Day weekend. Instead, the facility hosted what might be the largest food giveaway in the state's history. That's according to Gleaners Food Bank of Indiana, who provided groceries for 5,000 households yesterday. Recipients got up to 40 pounds of fresh fruit, vegetables, meat, and dairy products. Even though nationally the Feeding America research says that we're seeing about a 48% increase in hunger, in Indiana, unfortunately, it's about double that. We've been running about 100% higher, and it's only slightly tapering in the last couple of weeks. Even though the race is postponed, several Indy drivers still showed up anyway to show their support for the event. It is something you may have come across on social media. There is a graphic listing the CDC guidelines for when schools say they will reopen, including the use of masks and social distancing. At last check, it's been shared over 50,000 times. We ran it through our trust index to see if it matches the CDC guidelines. This is an image that's gone viral on social media, shared by numerous blogs with tens of thousands of views. You can see it lists 21 guidelines for schools to follow when they begin reopening. Online comments show it's caused some concern for parents. The image cites the CDC, but does this list say exactly what the CDC does? We ran it through our KSAT Trust Index and labeled the information, be careful. Here's why. The information on this list does reflect the content of the CDC's website, but some of the wording makes it seem like these guidelines are rules, when instead, they're just recommendations. One point on the blog's list that concerned some parents said, wear masks if over the age of two. We cross-referenced that with the CDC's website and found the CDC is encouraging children to wear masks, but says, quote, face coverings may be challenging for students, especially young students, to wear in all-day settings such as school. Another point garnering attention, only prepackaged boxes or bags of food instead of hot lunches. This one was taken a bit out of context. The CDC website says that only applies to events, not as part of the daily routine. One more point on the list says install sneeze guards or partitions when six feet apart won't work. This isn't included in the CDC's guidelines, but instead offered as an additional consideration, saying, if possible, schools may consider implementing these strategies to maintain healthy operations. We reached out to several local school districts and both Northeast and Northside ISD tell us they haven't finalized their plans. We're still waiting to hear back from several others. We've also pulled the CDC's explanations for many more of the points on this list. You can find that breakdown on KSAT.com. If you have a claim, picture, or video you want us to take a look at, head to KSAT.com and slash trust index and fill out the form. It's one more reason you can trust KSAT with the news that's important to you. It's been a busy night out there as we take a look out there with live cam looking at downtown and what we're left with really now some flashes of lightning rumbles of thunder that will continue but the rain will be getting lighter and lighter but rain will hang around for at least a couple more hours and uh, we're really getting a lot of damage reports in now this is from uh, 1604 and Braun. this was sent to us by our Justin Horn he's out in a subdivision in that part of the county uh, big time damage there this from Lake Hills over by near Medina Lake what you're looking at is a vehicle and then the roof collapsed on top of the vehicle. This damage due to straight line winds. Uh, another look at the Wild Horse subdivision fences down in many backyards, and that is the site across portions of Bear County. A lot of damage reports coming in. We've still got the squall line moving east into some of our easternmost communities. We'll take another live look at radar and get you the rest of your Memorial Day weekend forecast coming up here shortly as our severe weather coverage continues. Thank you, Katie. Her passion for watching them in city parks led her to publish a book on protecting our local birds. What's up, South Texas? Returns next.
Well, by day, she's a dispatcher, but during her free time, she's made it her job to educate others about birds. Yeah, Alicia Garlock has photographed birds for years, and now her pictures are leaving a lasting impact on others. She's next on What's Up South Texas, a segment where we highlight unique stories in our community. The night team's Jaffney Gray introduces us to Alicia and her message to the world. To cohabitate, you know, in our world, we have to share the space. You may have seen her at Breckenridge Park. If I'm talking to you and I see a bird, I'm probably going to look over there and be like, oh, a bird. <laughs> Walking. So there comes the good, the exercise. <laughs> Socializing. How's it going? <laughs> any, any, have you, you haven't seen the owl? And usually with a camera in hand. There he is. See, he's right on that branch hanging down. Her subjects. Birds. It's just a wow factor, and that's what I try to find or take a picture of, something that nobody has seen before. For Alicia Garlock, it's a passion which started years ago while living along the coast. Being around Rockport and all the birding stuff, it, there's so much to see out there. I loved it, and so I started, we call it chasing birds. As a single mother of three, life was challenging for Alicia, but she always found comfort in bird watching. She also suffers from a disease called gastroparesis. Where my stomach doesn't, uh, the muscles don't move, so it can cause pain. So me being distracted gives me, you know, an outlet. She soon discovered that outlet served a larger purpose. I saw nests destroyed, I saw them fall in the river. And you get close to nature and you see like, wow, that's really a struggle. Investing in research and proper equipment, Alicia learned of hundreds of species living in our local parks. They have owls in the back, uh, black chin hummingbirds nest along the river, hawks. And with all of her blood, sweat and tears, she published a book. The only way to educate the public or the main way is to show them a picture's worth a thousand words. With Colored thousands of pictures to raise awareness about rare. protecting birds. Eight. The feeling of saving a, a creature, you know, one of God's creatures, there's nothing that compares to it. Alicia's passion is very fly for What's Up South Texas. Love what God has given us to love and cherish it because you know, nothing's guaranteed and we don't know that our birds will come back or that they'll survive, you know, 20 years down the road, but at least we tried. Welcome back. We're going to get you back to our weather coverage, but first we wanted to check on check in on the CPS outage map. We know that Katie and Adam and Justin's been showing you through Storm Chaser the heavy winds that have caused a lot of these power outages. So if you look, there are 40,009 total customers affected, and that is with 366 active outages. At first, when we started this newscast, it was about 42,000. You can see on the very top left, the orange, the dark orange, is where the most outages will be. So that's right down here in the left-hand corner at 1604 and Marbach is where we're seeing more than 500,000 customers out. And as it moves east, we see a lot less, kind of in the 50 to 499 right here by China Grove and 1,000 to 5,000 right here, right surrounding Brook City Base. So obviously those crews could not get out there when the severe weather was passing, but they are starting to get out and about 2,000 fewer customers affected than when we did start this newscast. Yeah, the northwest side, one of the first areas to really get hit by these storms tonight. That's yeah, where uh, Justin Horn is out tonight in the storm chaser in the uh, Palomino Pass, the 9000 block of Palomino Passes, which is in the Wild Horse subdivision. There's been some damage there. We've seen some roofs taken off of houses, uh, some damage to fences and down trees uh, as well there. That's just one little pocket that we've been able to get to tonight. Lots of roof damage, and as you were showing us, Katie and Adam, so many fences down, and we know that even a wall was blown away in one of these homes. Yeah, yeah I saw a photo of that. It was a bedroom, it looked like, and the wall was uh, kind of pushed in a bit, and one of the studs was broken, just kind of snapped, and I, so far no dam I mean, no uh, injuries reported. With and, and that's not necessarily a tornado. That could be caused by straight-line winds, which are just as powerful. It's sometimes more powerful yeah. than the weak tornado. So this doesn't mean a tornado actually touched down. Right. It just means that there were strong winds. Mm -hmm. Weather Service will assess it in the days ahead and let us know definitively what it was. Yes, yeah. 
Um, if it's possible, could we, if we can go back to max one, I didn't give you guys much of a heads up there in our control room. If not, that's okay. We have a, had a picture. Here we go. Uh, so this is that subdivision that Justin is in right now. And this is a, this is a hugely compelling photo. This Correct me if I'm wrong, Adam. Looks to be some type of a uh, something looks, that has. It's, it's, it looks like a fence post with some pickets on it that has been pushed. blown into that what looks like a garage or the side of the house there. Yeah, that's the garage. So right through the garage wall. So a lot of fences were blown down. I'm thinking that's part of the fencing mm -hmm. that then connects to the picket. The pickets connect to. Yeah. But anything that can get pushed into that siding like that, I mean, that's some serious, serious wind, and that's all in that same uh, subdivision there. So we can go ahead and get back to uh, Lynx radar so Adam can give you the latest on this squall line as it continues to move east. Yeah, and we just heard from the National Weather Service, and they're going to allow the severe thunderstorm warnings to expire at 11 p.m. as this activity is it's slowly weakening a little bit. It's losing a little bit of its strength. So the warnings that we have, flip the clicker around, the warnings that we have still in effect um, right now are all basically east of San Antonio and our threat has passed. And there you go, Gonzales area, southward all the way down into Kennedy, you get into Carnes County. That's where we have the severe thunderstorm warnings right on the leading edge of this squall line that came together earlier this afternoon or late evening, pushed eastward. It's still moving eastward at 45 miles per hour, but it's losing a little bit of its kick. It's turning into more of just a good rain event with a lot of lightning and thunder. So still the potential for some wind gusts, maybe 50 to 60 miles per hour right along the leading edge of it. But flash flooding has been an issue. We've already seen about two inches of rain, actually over two inches of rain measured in parts of Bear County from this system. Then you get into Medina County and you see those orange and red areas. Those indicate rainfalls, at least estimated by the Doppler radar, of over four inches. Okay, so this is why we have that flash flood warning still in effect. You look at parts of San Antonio over two inches of rainfall in a very short amount of time. That's the key. It came so quickly. So and it's still raining a little bit on the back side of this. Hey, our threat in San Antonio, it's gone. Those of you in Gonzales, it's headed your way. It's not as strong as it was here, but still stay inside. And for an update on the forecast and what we can expect as we go into your Memorial Day, let's go over to Katie. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, for the next couple of hours, some lingering rain, rumbles of thunder, flashes of lightning will be possible. I can see our transguide cams in and around the city. There's still some flashes of lightning out there, so don't let that alarm you. The worst of it has passed, especially if you're in San Antonio and Bear County. A stray shower not out of the question through dawn tomorrow morning, but I think we'll start to see a good amount of sun by your Memorial Day morning as well. And tomorrow, just like the past days this weekend, the daytime hours will generally be rain free. An isolated pop up shower or storm not out of the question, but it will be tomorrow night, maybe into the pre dawn hours of Tuesday morning that another complex of storms could be moving in from the north and the west. And we'll have the very latest for you on that potential tomorrow. This is just an active weather pattern that we find ourselves in that allows for these complexes of storms to move in and develop over top of South Texas. So uh, more thunderstorms possible late in the day tomorrow. We get into Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Things are a bit more low key there, but some scattered storms could return to the forecast for the start of next weekend. And of course, we'll keep you updated. Sarah Spivey will be in for my Osterhage tomorrow morning on Good Morning San Antonio at 4.30. Guys. Thank you, Katie. We get a chance to catch our breath before we do it again. Yeah, absolutely. You guys have been doing such a great job. I know our viewers have been sending in those pictures, but also really positive comments. So we hope you guys were able to stay safe. Thankfully, this moved through pretty quickly. Yeah, we'll be right back. Kobe over Tim Duncan. That's who former Spurs Steven Jackson says he would pick to build a team around. What do the sports guys have to say about that? Plus, with the Indy 500 postponed and Formula One in Monaco canceled tonight, Championship Cinema takes a look at the movie Rush, Ron Howard's racing thriller that came out in 2013. With more on what's an instant replay, let's head over to Gregson. That was a big rivalry back in the day in F1 racing, and we check in with Texas State head coach Jake Spavadaw as he prepares to welcome back his players on June 1st, coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. There's no need to drive fast. Just increases the percentage of risk. We're not in a hurry, I'm not being paid. Right now, with zero incentive or reward, why would I drive fast? Because I'm asking you to. 
It's a sports classic. Our Andrew Seeley and Jessica Hunt review the movie Rush, starring Chris Hemsworth and Daniel Burrow, and the rivalry that exists between Formula One drivers James Hunt and Nikki Lauda, with little known facts about the picture. And besides, Steven Jackson's claim he would choose Kobe over Tim Duncan. The sports guys also debate if the NBA is set for a comeback in Florida. Hopefully we can get back in June or in July, but right now I'm just trying to stay positive and trying to stay in shape. All right, Andrew Seeley is taking us to the pool this Memorial Day weekend as two members of the Smithson Valley swim team train after getting their shot at a Division I school while conquering challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. And R.G. Marquez will visit with the head coach of Texas State as he prepares to welcome back his Bobcats on campus in just over a week. And New York announces that all sports can return right now. Pro sports can return to the state for training camps. Instant Replay is live, and it is next. That is great, great news. Definitely is. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back.